This is section 35 of The Thirty Thousand Dollar Bequest and Other Stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Advice to Little Girls Good little girls ought not to make mouths at their teachers for every trifling offense. This retaliation should only be resorted to under peculiarly aggravated circumstances. If you have nothing but a rag doll stuffed with sawdust, while one of your more fortunate little playmates has a costly china one, you should treat her with a show of kindness nevertheless, and you ought not to attempt to make a forcible swap with her unless your conscience would justify you in it, and you know you are able to do it. You ought never to take your little brother's chewing gum away from him by main force. It is better to rope him in with the promise of the first two dollars and a half you find floating down the river on a grindstone. In the artless simplicity natural to this time of life, he will regard it as a perfectly fair transaction. In all ages of the world, this eminently plausible fiction has lured the obtuse infant to financial ruin and disaster. If at any time you find it necessary to correct your brother, do not correct him with mud. Never on any account throw mud at him, because it will spoil his clothes. It is better to scald him a little, for then you obtain desirable results. You secure his immediate attention to the lessons you are inculcating, and at the same time your hot water will have a tendency to move impurities from his person, and possibly the skin, in spots. If your mother tells you to do a thing, it is wrong to reply that you won't, it is better and more becoming to intimate that you will do as she bids you, and then afterward act quietly in the matter according to the dictates of your best judgment. You should ever bear in mind that it is to your kind parents that you are indebted for your food, and your nice bed, and for your beautiful clothes, and for the privilege of staying home from school when you let on that you are sick. Therefore, you ought to respect their little prejudices, and humor their little whims, and put up with their little foibles until they get to crowding you too much. Good little girls always show marked deference for the aged. You ought never to sass old people, unless they sass you first. Post-Mortem Poetry, written in 1870 In Philadelphia they have a custom which it would be pleasant to see adopted throughout the land, it is that of appending to published death notices a little verse or two of comforting poetry. Any one who is in the habit of reading the daily Philadelphia ledger must frequently be touched by these plaintive tributes to extinguished worth. In Philadelphia the departure of a child is a circumstance which is not more surely followed by a burial than by the accustomed solacing poesy in the public ledger. In that city death loses half its terror because the knowledge of its presence comes thus disguised in the sweet drapery of verse. For instance, in a late ledger I find the following. I change the surname. Died. Hawks. On the seventeenth inst. Clara, the daughter of Ephraim and Laura Hawks, aged twenty-one months and two days. That merry shout no more I hear. No laughing child I see, no little arms are around my neck, no feet upon my knee. No kisses drop upon my cheek, these lips are sealed to me. Dear Lord, how could I give Clara up to any but to thee? A child thus mourned could not die wholly discontented. From the ledger of the same date I make the following extract, merely changing the surname as before. Beckett on Sunday morning, 19th inst., John P., infant son of George and Julia Beckett, aged one year, six months, and fifteen days. That merry shout no more I hear, no laughing child I see. No little arms are around my neck, no feet upon my knee. No kisses drop upon my cheek, these lips are sealed to me. Dear Lord, how could I give Johnny up to any but to thee. The similarity of the emotion as produced in the mourners in these two instances is remarkably evidenced by the singular similarity of thought which they experienced, and the surprising coincidence of language used by them to give it expression. 
in the same journal of the same date i find the following surname suppressed as before wagner on the tenth inst ferguson g the son of william l and martha teresa wagner aged four weeks and one day that merry shout no more i hear no laughing child i see no little arms are round my neck no feet upon my knee no kisses drop upon my cheek these lips are sealed to me dear lord how could i give ferguson up to any but to thee it is strange what power the reiteration of an essentially poetical thought has upon one's feelings when we take up the ledger and read the poetry about little clara we feel an unaccountable depression of the spirits when we drift further down the column and read the poetry about little johnny the depression of spirits acquires an added emphasis and we experience tangible suffering when we saunter along down the column further still and read the poetry about little ferguson the word torture but vaguely suggests the anguish that rends us in the ledger same copy referred to above i find the following i alter surname as usual welch on the fifth inst mary c welch wife of william b welch and daughter of catherine and george w markland in the twenty-ninth year of her age a mother dear a mother kind has gone and left us all behind cease to weep for tears are vain mother dear is out of pain farewell husband children dear serve thy god with filial fear and meet me in the land above where all is peace and joy and love what could be sweeter than that no collection of salient facts without reduction to tabular form could be more succinctly stated than is done in the first stanza by the surviving relatives and no more concise and comprehensive program of farewells post-mortuary general orders etc could be framed in any form than is done in verse by deceased in the last stanza these things insensibly make us wiser and tenderer and better another extract ball on the morning of the fifteenth inst mary e daughter of john and sarah f ball tis sweet to rest in lively hope that when my change shall come angels will hover round my bed to waft my spirit home the following is apparently the customary form for heads of families burns on the twentieth inst michael burns aged forty years dearest father thou hast left us here thy loss we deeply feel but tis god that has bereft us he can all our sorrows heal funeral two o'clock sharp there is something very simple and pleasant about the following which in philadelphia seems to be the usual form for consumptives of long standing it deplores four distinct cases in the single copy of the ledger which lies on the memoranda editorial table bromley on the twenty-ninth inst of consumption philip bromley in the fiftieth year of his age affliction sore long time he bore physicians were in vain till god at last did hear him mourn and eased him of his pain that friend whom death from us has torn we did not think so soon to part an anxious care now sinks the thorn still deeper in our bleeding heart this beautiful creation loses nothing by repetition on the contrary the oftener one sees it in the ledger the more grand and awe-inspiring it seems with one more extract i will close doble on the fourth inst samuel Purville worthington doble aged four days our little sammy's gone his tiny spirits fled our little boy we loved so dear lies sleeping with the dead a tear within a father's eye a mother's aching heart can only tell the agony how hard it is to part could anything be more plaintive than that without requiring further concessions of grammar could anything be likely to do more toward reconciling deceased to circumstances and making him willing to go perhaps not the power of song can hardly be estimated there is an element about some poetry which is able to make even physical suffering and death cheerful things to contemplate and consummation to be desired this element is present in the mortuary poetry of philadelphia degree of development 
the custom i have been treating of is one that should be adopted in all the cities of the land it is said that once a man of small consequence died and the rev t k beecher was asked to preach the funeral sermon a man who abhors the louding of people either dead or alive except in dignified and simple language and then only for merits which they actually possessed or possess not merits which they merely ought to have possessed the friends of the deceased got up a stately funeral they must have had misgivings that the corpse might not be praised strongly enough for they prepared some manuscript headings and notes in which nothing was left unsaid on that subject that a fervid imagination and an unabridged dictionary could compile and these they handed to the minister as he entered the pulpit they were merely intended as suggestions and so the friends were filled with consternation when the minister stood in the pulpit and proceeded to read off the curious odds and ends in ghastly detail and in a loud voice and their consternation solidified to petrification when he paused at the end contemplated the multitude reflectively and then said impressively the man would be a fool who tried to add anything to that let us pray and with the same strict adhesion to truth it can be said that the man would be a fool who tried to add anything to the following transcendent obituary poem there is something so innocent so guileless so complacent so unearthly serene and self-satisfied about this peerless hogwash that the man must be made of stone who can read it without a dulcet ecstasy creeping along his backbone and quivering in his marrow there is no need to say that this poem is genuine and in earnest for its proofs are written all over its face an ingenious scribbler might imitate it after a fashion but shakespeare himself could not counterfeit it it is noticeable that the country editor who published it did not know that it was a treasure and the most perfect thing of its kind that the storehouses and museums of literature could show he did not dare to say no to the dread poet for such a poet must have been something of an apparition but he just shoveled it into his paper anywhere that came handy and felt ashamed and put that disgusted published by request over it and hoped that his subscribers would overlook it or not feel an impulse to read it published by request lines composed on the death of samuel and catherine belknap's children by m a glaze friends and neighbors all draw near and listen to what i have to say and never leave your children dear when they are small and go away but always think of that sad fate that happened in year of sixty three four children with a house did burn think of their awful agony their mother she had gone away and left them there alone to stay the house took fire and down did burn before their mother did return their piteous cry the neighbors heard and then the cry of fire was given but ah before they could them reach their little spirits had flown to heaven their father he to war had gone and on the battlefield was slain and little did he think when he went away but what on earth they would meet again the neighbors often told his wife not to leave his children there unless she got some one to stay and of the little ones take care the oldest he was years not six and the youngest only eleven months old but often she had left them there alone as by the neighbors i have been told how can she bear to see the place where she so oft has left them there without a single one to look to them or of the little ones to take good care oh can she look upon the spot where under their little burnt bones lay but what she thinks she hears them say twas god had pity and took us on high and there may she kneel down and pray and ask god her to forgive and she may lead a different life while she on earth remains to live her husband and her children too god has took from pain and woe may she reform and mend her ways that she may also to them go and when it is god's holy will oh may she be prepared to meet her god and friends in peace and leave this world of care end of section thirty five